fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is here. I'm here in, in the, the house. house. Yeah, you're in the house. You know, I'm in the house. We're back at her again. It's, just, it's, it's right. back at the grind. That's we're right. Grind, we're grinding like coffee. That's right. For another year. Another year. 24. Another day. Another dollar. <laughs> You know, I, we should start, you know, this just, uh, you see, Amazon's going to charge for ads, right? Or going to have ads or pay two bucks more. So, oh, oh for the video. Yeah. yeah. So, but we, should, so we'll charge a dollar then. <laughs> 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 there you go. Yeah. Pay a we'll dollar. Just, we'll just and, jump right on the, the, uh, yeah. yeah. No ads right. for a buck. <laughs> it's, uh, Perfect. Yeah. Do that per episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it'll work. No, yeah. no, they probably no. start turning into, they'll start wa- listening to authors on the air or something, I don't know. Yeah, right, they'll, they'll have to send it to us, you know, send money via uh, uh, mail. Yeah, yeah, post. cash, cash in the post. <laughs> Western Union. Yeah, post is going out the door too, you know. I know. Well, let's see, now we are, we're continuing with the murder this week. Okay, not real murder. Yeah. This is like fictional murder, crime murder, fiction, you know, all that stuff. So we've got a returning guest uh, and her new book, Murder at the Pontchartrain. And it's the Sydney Lockhart Mystery Series. And this is book six, I believe. No, it's book five or book six. Well, let's let's talk. This is book six. Get your stuff together here. So Kathleen Casca, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. So um, now this is book six, right? This is book six, yes. Perfect. So Sydney Lockhart, um, first of all, who is Sydney Lockhart? Sydney Lockhart is a 29-year-old woman. Uh, she lives in the 1950s, and she is trying to make it in a man's world as a private detective. And, uh, you know, challenges, women had challenges back in the 50s, and I didn't want to make things easy on her. So um, this is what I designed for her. She's a detective, and she didn't start out that way, but it just kind of happened with the first mystery. Uh, and usually in the books, she uh, checks into a historic hotel, and there's a murder, and she's usually the prime suspect. So she has to not only solve the murder, but she also have to has to clear her name. So there's a lot she uh, has to deal with in these books. Boy, sounds like it. How do you decide? Because um, book six, so you've kind of got the the same character going through. How do you decide what kind of things or murders they're going to have to solve? Like, how, how does that come first to you in, in each time you write a, a book in the series? Or is it is it something else? Well, the first thing I do is I select the hotel. And I do research. And there are usually hotels that I've stayed in quite often. So I'm familiar with the setting, the hotel, and their location. And I start doing some research. And um, I'm a pantser, so I don't really outline beforehand I just start writing and, and things begin to unfold. And I write nonfiction as well, but the fun thing about writing fiction is that I never really know where I'm going to go. I kind of let, let my characters tell me their stories and I just uh, write it down. So that's interesting. How do you pick your hotels? Like, what is it? I mean, other than because you know, you've stayed there, so you kind of got the sense of the hotel, but is there something in particular that you, that, you choose a hotel for? Yes. Um, I look for hotels that are mainly in the South. 
Uh, most of my books are set in Texas. I have one set in Arkansas. And, of course, Murder at the Poncha Train is set in New Orleans. But I look for hotels that, of course, were around in the 1950s and that are still operating today. So if you pick up my book and you want to read it and then you decide you want to visit the hotel, well, you can. Uh, so that that's about really the only criteria I have is I have to be familiar with the hotel. It has to be in the South and it has to still be in operation today. Okay, There's a, but it, it, there doesn't have to be a murder or something that happened at the hotel. It's just sort of, um, it's more about the atmosphere of the hotel, I guess. Well, no, there there does have to be a murder at the hotel. That's true. There there has to be a murder there. And uh, like I said before, Sydney's usually the suspect because she's around the area when it happens. Oh, of course. I've got to blame it on her anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm wondering too. Um, you know, you you've uh, with with the Ponch Train Hotel. Did you pick the Ponch Train Hotel specifically because of the hotel itself, or was also New Orleans itself a factor? Um, did, did New Orleans make a great setting uh, for for a uh, for a mystery? Mer uh, New Orleans makes a wonderful setting. In my uh, book, right before this, the uh, the fifth book, Murder at the Minger, there are a couple of scenes that take place in New Orleans. Murder at the Minger is set in, the San, in San Antonio, but the story leads to New Orleans for part of it. And so I really liked the atmosphere of the city. And when I decided on my sixth book, I said, okay, I need to send her back to New Orleans because um, it, it's got such a mystery around it. And there's so much that uh, I can add to my book, like when you think of New Orleans, you think maybe of the voodoo mystique it has. So I've added some of that into my book. I pick in my book, I pick a lot of locations and businesses that are still in operation, like the restaurants and the clubs and um and, and things like that. So when somebody's reading my book, they can get a real sense of what it's like being in that city. Well, how do you how do you get them into the 50s, though? Are you going through old newspapers or old films or something? How do you bring back that, that time? I do. I do do some research. I go to the hotel and I uh, see what I can find out there. And then I um, have gone to the libraries and looked at old newspapers and I look for real events that took place in the hotel or in the city where they're set that I can use in the story. I, I don't always do that, but I try to. Um, like Murder at the Galvez, which is set at the Galvez Hotel in Galveston, Texas. I used a real controversy that was going on in the 50s to weave it into the uh, murder plot of that story. Well, that's interesting. And and I guess you, you also pick up kind of the dialogue and the slang from things like that as well, right? Yes, I have a whole uh, <laughs> uh, uh, boulder on uh, dialogue and slang from the 50s and expressions and, and things like that. Yeah, I do. And plus, I, you know, I read a lot of uh, books that were set during that decade or even earlier in the 40s. And that helps also to get my mind in uh, prepared for what it's like and how people act and how people talk back then. Yeah, I would imagine it would be the, one of the hardest things just because you've got her as a female trying to be in the detective world in the 50s. Um, I guess bringing up how how general people would react to that would be kind of one of the the harder things to kind of get out um, so that people understand that today. Right, right. She uh, she runs up against a lot of uh, discrimination, you know, you can imagine, and a lot of questions like, you know, what are you doing in this field? You have no business in, in this man's world and, and that sort of thing. Um, she does have a partner in, in her detective agency. In fact, they opened up the agency together and um, not only are they partners in business, but they're, they have a relationship going on. So, you know, there's that. And he's kind of a segue into 
allowing her to get her foot in the door to some of the places she has to investigate. Um, so, yeah, but um, there's always that question about what are you doing here? Why are you asking these questions? You're a woman. You know, you don't have any business in this in this field. And uh, so that's there. Was the PI business very different than the 1950s? There weren't many women in that in that business, um, and it is it was quite a bit different. There's a there's a lot of um, uh, investigations where you go out, and you interview people, and you follow them, and you have stakeouts and that sort of thing. Whereas today, if you're a private investigator, a lot of your work is done online. Right. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's a big difference. So oh, it's yeah. hands on. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on, uh, going to different places, uh, interviewing people, getting in trouble, and you know, <laughs> finding yourself in a tight spot that you can't get out of. So that that's, doesn't happen that much today with uh, private detecting. Well, how about um, liberties? Do you have to take a lot of liberties with um, what, a, what a PI can do in real life? Because I know sometimes they're not allowed to you know, uh, interfere with the criminal investigation, stuff like that. Is, is there stuff that they can do within a fictional story that they can't do in real life? Oh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can bend the rules a lot, but I try not to bend them too much because I, I want the book to be real. I want I want to be it, it to be based on how things really are. So uh, I will have uh, other people read my books and uh, and – People that are in the business and, you know, can give me some suggestions on if I've done everything, anything wrong or if I need to fix anything. Uh, for instance, I'm, I just finished another mystery, and uh, this is not a Sydney Lockhart. It's a um, mystery set in current times in, um, on the Cornish coast in England. And uh, so, you know, I'm not English. I, I do read a lot of British mysteries. So I found uh, a person who got his training as a detective in that area of England, and I sent my manuscript to him, and he had gave me a lot of good suggestions. So I try to find a beta reader that knows the era or knows the area and uh, can check me out to make sure that I've, I've covered my bases so, uh, what got you into writing and writing mysteries that what is it about these mystery and crime stories that you like so much uh i've always enjoyed mysteries and um as time went on and the more i read uh, the more i wanted to see if i could just actually write one um, i started off writing mystery trivia and uh, because in the 90s, and it's still true today, it was easier to get your foot in the door of publishing if you publish a nonfiction book or if you write a nonfiction book. So, and at the time, in the 90s, uh, trivia books were really popular. So I started off writing the Agatha Christie trivia book and uh, went on to write the Alfred Hitchcock trivia book and the Sherlock Holmes trivia book. Uh, the Sherlock Holmes trivia book is still in publication. It's in its third printing. Uh, the other two right now are uh, out of print, uh, but we'll I'll see what I can do with that. Uh, anyway, so I started off publishing these first three mystery trivia books, and that was a good ed education for me. Um, so it was several years before I decided to try my hand at writing my own mystery and uh, it it was it took a while to to get the feeling of it. Uh, but what helps me the most is reading mysteries that are that I like that would be similar to what I'm writing. Uh, the Sydney Lockhart mystery has, even though it's set in the fifties, has been compared to um, Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum series. Uh, which I think is is a compliment. Uh, so the characters are zany, and uh, there's always something crazy going on. And uh, so, uh, you know, that that's the flavor of those books. Who inspires you in the mystery world? 
Well, my favorite authors, uh, Janet Ivanovich, and then I read a lot of, I've read a lot of Dick Francis and uh, Carl Heisen, and I really love Martha Grimes, Elizabeth Peters, um, Spencer Quinn. Uh, let's see, there's a Texas author I really enjoy. He writes the Blanco County Mysteries, and his name is Ben Ryder. So um, that's where I get my inspiration, is is from other other authors who I really, really enjoy. Well, when you talk about zaniness, um, you're talking, uh, you know, basically about humor. And I'm just wondering, when you put humor into a book, um, just like a stand-up comedian is said to need timing to make the joke go over, do you, do you feel that there's a comic timing of sorts that's needed to make prose fiction humorous? Uh, well, yeah, and, and that, that comes along in the dialogue. Um, Sydney has a um, cousin. Uh, it's kind of her sidekick. Her name is Ruth. She's very different from Sydney. And she is best described as a blonde bubblehead. And she's always coming up with, with weird ideas. And uh, she gets her words wrong. And she's she sounds like she's just, you know, really a dumb blonde. But underneath, she's really very smart. But Sydney plays into, to, into this dumb blonde personality that she has. Um, so a lot of the humor I write into it um, has to do, you know, with the characters and their relationship and uh, the crazy things they get into. Um, there's another character in the series. She showed up in the um, fourth book, uh, Murder at the Driscoll, which takes place in Austin, Texas. And she was only going to be in, in one book, but she was such a hit that she's one of the regular characters now. And she is a 12-year-old girl who is probably the smartest character of any of my characters. So, um, you know, and, and she's she's just wonderful. I just love having her, her in there. I've gotten a lot of positive comments. Are, are you going to bring back Lydia? It's like, yes, yeah, she's, a, she's a fixture in the, in the series now. What's your relationship with your characters? Like, do you hear them, see them, feel them, or uh, describe what you um, what you deal with when you're writing these characters? Um, I I guess the best way to describe it is that um, I just listen to them. You know, they they tell me what's going on, and you know, and and I start writing, and then it just uh, snowballs from there uh, you know a lot of authors say that they have conversations with their characters and it's not so much that I have conversations with my characters but I can hear the conversations they're having with one another and uh, I you know I just I just start writing um, and that's the fun part about writing fiction it's almost like reading fiction because I never know what's going to happen uh, in the next chapter. I mean, I might have some ideas, but I just play along to see what's going to happen. And then when I'm about three quarters into the book, that's when all the hard work starts <laughs> because I have to go back and make sure everything ties together and make sure all the loose ends are tied up. And I usually do not know who the killer is until my character does. And at that point, I have to go back and do a lot of rewriting, put in the put in the uh, red herrings and uh, that sort of thing. But that's fun, too. You know, I, it's like putting together a puzzle. Uh, you know, you know where you're going. You're not sure how to get there. And then things might change at the end. Um, so and, and, you know, in a couple of times I've changed the killer at the end. But I'm pretty much just kind of sitting back and, and watching the show listening to the characters, and visualizing what's happening. Well, you talking about uh, tying up loose ends. Uh, that speaks, I guess, to continuity. And I'm just wondering, do you, um, how do you keep your, your continuity um, accurate? Do, do you have a, a series Bible? Do you have a system? Do you uh, take certain notes? Um, how do you keep everything um, 
it basically tied up so that uh, everything kind of works together through through these books. Okay, I I have a notebook which I keep with me, and um, when I get to that point where I have to start putting everything together, I'll go back and I'll read it and I'll make notes and I'll make notes of what days things happened and um, what I need to look for. And then I will um, outline the scenes that I've already written so I know what happened in what scene. And, um, you know, I just kind of, it's kind of like a backward outline. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of authors will outline first and then they'll write. And I will write and then I will stop and go back and make an outline of what I have already written so I can keep things straight in my mind. And I have a notebook that I uh, use and I, you know, take notes in it and ask questions and I make notes of certain pages that I need to go back and check. Um, so I, I guess you could say I kind of work backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same. <laughs> Better backwards than not working, right? I mean, right. Right. <laughs> so um, what's the hardest part of writing one of these books for you? Uh, that that's that's it right there, tying up the loose ends. That that's the hardest part because um, sometimes things don't run as smoothly as I want, and I'll I'll have to go back and make changes. And making changes is is like. Um, you know, you make one change and then another change has to happen and then another change. It's, it's just like knocking down a row of dominoes. You know, you have to just make sure you've got everything covered. Um, so, and, you know, changes are important because, you know, you don't, you don't know if a certain scene fits in a certain place or maybe you should move it. And once I start doing that, it becomes complicated and that's where the work starts. Uh, it might take me three or four months to write the first draft and maybe eight or nine months to pull it all together once I'm done. So what do you, do do you have a point or do you have some sort of a theme or something you want people to get out of reading these books? Well, it's, it's mainly um, dealing with a strong young woman who's determined to make this career work. That, that's the theme. It's, it's a strong woman trying to make it in a man's world. Um, and that's why it's said in the 50s, because it, it was much harder then than it is now. So it's like Barbie. Kind of, yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah. So um, how much of yourself do you think goes into Sidney Lockhart or any of the characters that you have? Well, the the way I'd li- like to answer that is that Sydney's kind of my ultra ego, and she does things that I would never do, and she says things that I would never say, and so uh, I can like work my fantasies out through her. Uh, I wish I could say I was as bold <laughs> as she is, but uh, I'm not. Um, so you know, she's just she's. She's someone who I wish I could be like, but I can't. So I write it. I write it into the story. I mean, I'm not going to go around with a gun in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go around, uh, you know, with uh, tracking someone in in the dark in a cemetery or in the woods. I'm, I'm you know, I'm not going to do that. So she's bolder than I am. Well, speaking of your characters, you know, you mentioned that you had a character who's a 12-year-old girl. Uh, over the series, are, are you going to have your characters age? Is she going to age throughout the series, or is it going to be slower? How do you handle that? Well, I like to look at my series. I like my characters to move on and to grow and to develop and change, because that's what you do in life. You don't, you're not stagnant, you know. Uh so, but the the change happens slowly. Like the first six books occur in like a year and a half of Sydney's life. So, uh, so it's it's changing. Um, new characters are coming in. Old characters are going out. Sydney's moving along with her life. There's always that um, wonder of when Sydney and Dixon 
if they're going to get married and when they're going to get married. And um, they come real close several times, but something always gets in the way and it, it doesn't happen. So there's a progression in their lives in the story. But um, from one story to the next, it's usually only a few weeks before uh, one mystery is solved and the other mystery starts, and which kind of makes sense because they've got a detective agency, so there are different cases coming in all the time. You know, your your extra characters, too, your side characters and stuff, um, where do you get them? Are they sort of influenced by people you've seen around? No, they're not. They're, they're characters that uh, just seem to to hook up with my main characters, uh, the only the only character that I've really sort of envisioned from a real person was is Sydney's cousin Ruth, but uh, she was kind of built on. Uh, she's similar to a friend of mine, which I kind of say that hesitantly because uh, the friend that I was thinking of when I was developing Ruth is a lot smarter. <laughs> than Ruth, but uh, she was just kind of a model for it. But usually uh, my characters aren't based on anyone I know. Uh, they just kind of show up. You know, they just kind of show up in Sydney's life. And they work. You know, they work. Uh, Sydney has a, a brother, and she her parents are in, in, the, in many of the stories. Uh, Ruth is in the stories, Lydia and Dixon. And... Um, there are other characters that, you know, appear at times. So it's like a family, you know, it's like a family that's moving along. And, you know, in your family, you meet new people and some of them stay in your life and some of them fall by the wayside and then you just move on. So what do you got coming up next? Like what what's going on with uh, Kathleen now? Well, I have a lot I'm working on. I'm working on the seventh Sydney Lockhart series, Mystery. I've got two, after this one, I've got two other hotels that I have on my list that uh, I want to I want to use. I also write another series called the Kate Carraway Animal Rights Mysteries. And there are three in those series. They're set in current times. Again, my character is a woman who's trying to make it in a difficult world. Uh, she is an animal rights activist. And each of my books is set around an animal rights issue. And then, uh, I, like I said, I just finished The British Mystery. And I have a uh, hard-boiled detective mystery that was set, that is set in Manhattan in 1945, and that's ready to go out the door. So I, you know, I basically write what I like to read. And um, so I've got several things going on at one time, which is good because if I ever, I like to write so many hours a day and if I ever come to a point where I have I don't know where I'm going I'm stuck then I can go to another story and work on that so I can feel like I've been productive throughout the day yeah keep busy you know right. All that stuff. are you on social media do you have a website how do readers find you it's real easy it's just my name Kathleen Koska uh, dot com and uh, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram. Uh, you can go to my website and, and find out how to contact me. But uh, and then I have an Amazon page, so I'm I'm out there on social media. Just you know, Google my name and you'll find me. Yeah, you're around. Wow, fantastic! We'll have all of that up on our website too, so people can find you easily. Thank you. Know. you. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the book. Uh, we've got Murder at the Poncha Train, and that's a Cindy Sydney Lockhart mystery. So, Kathleen Casca, the author, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Kathleen. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.